On this episode of Pilot's Discretion, we're joined by longtime instructor and former Microsoft Flight Simulator product manager, Bruce Williams. He talks about the early days of flight sim, flying IFR in technically advanced aircraft, and teaching aerobatics in an extra. Pilot's Discretion starts right now. Hello, everyone. I'm your host, John Zimmerman of Sporties. Remember to visit sporties.com slash podcast for all of today's show links and for access to every episode of Pilot's Discretion. You can also email us if you have comments or guest ideas, podcast at sporties.com. Today, I'm joined by flight instructor and writer Bruce Williams. He started flying in high school and went on to work at Microsoft in the mid-90s, where he was involved with six different versions of their popular flight simulator program. He even wrote two books about using flight simulators for training. Since leaving Microsoft, he has spent a lot of time either teaching or writing about flying. He specializes in IFR and glass cockpit instruction and has logged a lot of time in both Beechcraft Bonanzas and Extra 300s. Bruce, welcome to Pilot's Discretion. It's great to be here. Thanks for asking me. I want to begin with Flight Simulator because you had a front row seat to a really fascinating time in digital aviation. You know, there's lots of talk these days about the metaverse and and gaming in that whole world. But really, 25 years ago, you were creating a version of a metaverse, weren't you? I mean, there were virtual airlines, right? Oh, it was it was an amazing time. Uh, when, when I joined the team, we were working on the last version of the DOS version of uh, Flight Simulator. And then we went through a, a major transformation because we acquired uh, the Bruce Hartwick organization, which is the original developer of Flight Sim, and brought it in-house and therefore were able to expand the product uh, in many, many ways, including essentially adding the entire world, all the airports uh, uh, around the world, uh, uh, new aircraft and so forth. And that was really my primary job was working with uh, outside companies like Jeppesen, Cessna, and others to bring more realism and data into the product. And it really expanded it rapidly as we went then into the Windows versions. There's this long running debate about whether it's a simulator or a game. Tell me the difference and which side you're on. Well, you've you've touched a, a sore point for me. I had many, many discussions during my time at Microsoft about that very topic because Flight Simulator was in the games group. We reorged many times, but we'll, let's just call it the games group. And so we were always fighting for attention with whatever the other games were at the time. Um, sports games, action games, racing games, whatever. And I was constantly making the uh, distinction between a simulation and a game. And I often use the analogy of, let's take movies, for example. There are lots of action movies, car chases, shoot 'em ups you know, action hero type movies. And those are fun. There's nothing wrong with that. But there's also very compelling, award-winning uh, movies that reach you at a different level, dramas, for example, uh, and I think simulation is more like the drama. It's not necessarily, at least in this case, we're not doing like a combat simulation, air combat simulation. Uh, this is more like uh, a drama in the sense that you're immersed in this experience, but it's not, uh, you know, rapid fire uh, special effects. And I was always trying to make that point. Simulation can be equally compelling and uh, successful as a product. Uh, but it's a diff it takes a different mindset in order to produce it well. I'm on the simulation side. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting because I heard you describe this once in another interview. You said something to the effect of you make your own story in Flight Simulator. There's no plot you're following like a, like a game, a, a level to complete or a, a, an ultimate goal. It's sort of the freedom to you know start up and fly wherever you want. Is that a key difference? It really is. And uh, getting back to your earlier question about the metaverse, as it were. Obviously, in the early, in my early days working at Flight Simulator, the internet wasn't really a thing yet. Uh, people couldn't connect directly like they can today, and so they really were. Although there were obviously forums and and ways people had conventions and things, but it was it was mostly a solitary experience, and so you did have to make your own uh, story. And yet, people then uh, brought whatever their particular interests were to the to the experience. So for example, uh, we had virtual airlines, people who wanted to recreate the experience or try to create the experience of being an airline pilot, even on long haul flights. People would sit and fly simulator for hours. Um, or 
you know, the fantasy of flying an airplane that they, you know, uh, otherwise wouldn't get a chance to fly. And we had, we have many, many customers around the world. I'm sure the demographic is the same, uh, even today in places where like Europe, where flying is very expensive or difficult to get into as a general aviation pilot, they could not, uh, uh, enjoy that experience, that fantasy of being a pilot by being a pilot. So flight simulation was a way for them to do that. Or people who, for whatever reason, weren't able to pursue flight training and a, uh, getting a pilot certificate and so forth, medical issues, family, cost, whatever it might be, flight simulation was, again, a way for them to have that experience. Now, when it comes to training, a home simulator is obviously not the equivalent of a full motion level D sim, but it can certainly be useful. You wrote two books on this. So what are the most valuable things to learn or practice in a sim? Well, let me step back and just let's look at it more generally. I often quote Yogi Berra when I talk about flight simulation. Um, and one of the things he said was, baseball is 90% mental, the other half is physical. <laughs> and uh, I think that really applies to flying, uh, being a pilot as well. Certainly as an instructor, most of, what, most of the issues I see with people when I do flight reviews or IPCs checkouts, people who already have a pilot certificate, they've had some flight experience, is staying mentally in the game is the hardest part. Yeah, they might be able to, you know, perfect or work on their crosswind landing technique or, you know, whatever particular skill is. But the, the major issue is typically uh, solving the puzzle that we all have to f solve constantly as we fly. And so this is where simulation really comes in. Regardless of where you are in your training, your student pilot working on a private pilot certificate, instrument flying, whatever it may be, the first hurdle to get over is understanding the environment you're operating in. What's the puzzle you're trying to solve? Even simple things like basic skills, like doing cockpit flows. Uh, um, what's the rhythm of a flight? Uh, we're not talking necessarily here about you know emergency procedures and sort of the exotic stuff. It's just okay, what am I supposed to do at this phase of flight? What should I be prepared for with the next phase of flight? And so simulation in the broadest sense of the word, doesn't matter whether it's a PC-based home simulation, doesn't matter whether it's a uh, uh, avionics uh, simulation such as Garmin offers on your, for an iPad or on a PC, uh, part task trainer, uh, or whether it's a, an ATD or an FTD or a full flight simulator. Uh, when, when, for example, if you go to get a type rating, uh, in a biz jet, they don't immediately put you into a, a, a level D sim. You go through a, a bunch of preliminary steps to learn the systems, learn the, where the switches are in the cockpit, understand how to program the FMS. You do, those, you do that in park task trainers or at home even now with some kind of simulation, PC-based simulation. Then when you're ready, mentally ready to go on, they put you into the device where you can then practice applying those skills and that knowledge that you've, that you've learned. What's your best tip for somebody who maybe has a home simulator and, uh, you know, they've flown around, had fun with it, but they want to get more training value out of it. Is there one tip you'd offer to that person? I don't know if it's a single tip, but I would say that um, don't obsess about uh, the flight controls and the fidelity, the exact match to your particular avionics or aircraft. Uh, the, the closer you can get, the better. And the newer controls that are available now, the newer yokes and throttles and so forth are much better than what we had 10, 15 years ago. But again, the focus should be on the mental side. So make sure that you're actually, uh, while you're having fun, I mean, there's nothing wrong with zooming around and going under the Golden Gate Bridge if that's what you want to do in a simulation, but uh, have a plan. You know, think about what do I want to accomplish on this flight? Do I want to fly a particular type of approach? Do I want to practice navigation? Do I want to practice uh, visual navigation? Now it's good enough you can do that. Um, you know, have a, have a specific set of goals, just like you would for any lesson with a flight instructor. Let's move from sims to real world flying. Uh, I know you recently returned from a coast to coast flight in an A36 Bonanza, and you were telling me how much a trip like that has really been transformed by modern technology, like glass cockpits, autopilots, data link weather. What has changed about a trip like that? Well, I've now done two, uh, literal coast-to-coast -coast trips in my Bonanzas since I had the panel updated to all the latest Garmin gear. Um, and I obviously use an EFB. On my, I have an iPad with ForeFlight. And uh, on the one hand, it's just it's transformational in the sense that I spend a lot less time uh, 
on the drudgery of planning. I don't have to calculate wind correction angles and estimated times en route. Um, and I have all of the information that I could possibly want readily at hand. Uh, I, I, I no longer have boxes, literally boxes of charts in the back of the airplane like I've had on previous uh, similar trips. Um, and I know they're current. And so all of that just really reduces the stress. And I can now make much more informed, earlier strategic decisions regarding weather and uh, fuel stops and so forth, uh, diversions if necessary, because I don't have to, uh, I've got all the information in one place and it's easy for me to uh, switch back and forth between uh, VFR and IFR charts, for example, um, look up airport data in the chart supplement or other sources. Uh, so that just takes a lot of the stress out. There is, I think, uh, these last couple of flights have, have uh, long trips have made me more aware of what I have observed with a lot of pilots who are either learning to fly with this, with this type of technology or switching to it. And that is, I think, it's now so easy that many pilots aren't taking enough time to, to really prepare for a flight. So uh, you, don't long, you no longer have to, for example, uh, file your jet revisions every couple of weeks, go through your binders and pull out the old charts and put the new ones in. And then that was sort of a clue. You'd look at it and say, hmm, the ILS approach, there's a new chart, what changed? Now it just all happens automatically in the background. You've got all the current charts. And I think many pilots, the first time they're looking at a chart, especially on a trip to an airport maybe they're not familiar with, is when they're getting ready to do the approach. And so what I have really tried to emphasize in the talks I give to pilot groups and the pilots that I work with in training is to, okay, since you no longer have to spend so much time in the drudgery of just basic uh, arithmetic, let's spend a little bit more time actually looking at what we're planning to do. Review the charts. Uh, I even annotate my charts, my IFR charts, especially the approach charts, to highlight important details to help me figure out how I'm going to fly the procedure, um, make sure I don't forget things like I'm prone to, for example, like turning on the pilot controlled lighting. Um, so it, it just, you know, change your tactics a bit and understand that the, te te the technology is not a one-to-one -one replacement for uh, what we used to do with paper charts and so forth. It actually does change how we should plan and execute our flights. I think you make a great point there about the comfort. Definitely, I think there's an argument to be made that all these tools make flying safer if you know how to use them. But I think it's sometimes overlooked that it can just make a flight more comfortable, both for passengers and for the pilot, less uncertainty, less stress. So uh, not to be overlooked in all this. But I'm wondering on a trip like that, do you have some habits that have changed? You know, maybe you're not frantically dialing in a new VOR every 15 minutes. So are there some new habits you have on a long cross country? Well, I would say I've thought about this a lot on these trips. Um, and I've basically, now that I have, for example, the Garmin GFC 600 autopilot in my airplane, it's a you know reliable, accurate, uh, real co-pilot. Uh, it's not something I have to keep an eye on and, and have doubts about. So I've kind of adopted the, the pilot flying, pilot not flying model that crewed uh, biz jet and airline crews have, have long used. And so during most of a flight, unless I want practice hand flying, I let the autopilot be the pilot flying. That is the, the person responsible for maintaining course and heading and, and altitude and so forth, while I then monitor the aircraft systems, the weather and so forth, and make strategic decisions, not tactical decisions. I have found on these flights that I have almost never have to make a decision sort of in the heat of the moment anymore, because I know I'm flying toward bad weather, so I don't go there uh, before I get into the into the turbulence and the rain and, and so forth, or the ice. Uh, if I want to divert for whatever reason or change the plan, I can do that while I'm at cruise. The autopilot's handling the chore of flying the airplane while I look up the data, really plan what's going to happen next. So that has been the true transformational thing. Now that does not this does not, of course, mean that because you're the quote unquote pilot not flying that you're sitting back and, you know, reading uh, uh, something on your iPad instead of paying attention to the flight. I'm actually more engaged, I think, because I'm really thinking about all these other issues instead of having to spend so much of my mental energy. Am I on, am I on the right course? Am I holding altitude? Uh, you know, what's ATC saying to me? Um, 
Uh, I have more time for these other decisions, which I think lead to so many of the issues we read about with accident reports or, or other situations where pilots have just gotten behind the curve. Specifically on glass cockpits, which is related but slightly different from autopilots or EFBs or data link weather, when you do instruction with pilots who are new to glass cockpit airplanes, what do you see them struggle with? What's still a pain point there? Well, there's some just, you know, we often talk about the sort of too much information, information overload from these new panels. I actually think that's a bit of a myth. And I talk about that sometimes because, you know, I have a picture that I show where I was ferrying a Cessna years ago and I had a big chart in my lap and it had a pretty standard panel for like an early 2000s Cessna. And if I was cruising along and I needed, for example, to get an update on the weather, what did I have to do? I had to go off frequency, talk to flight service, and then try by taking dictation, figure out where that line of thunderstorms he was talking about was. I don't have to do that anymore. Uh, I think the issue really is that when you're looking at uh, a PFD moving map type and an EFB, an iPad on, uh, on the yoke, is that the information is constantly in front of you. You're not actively going off to look for it. And you have to learn how to filter what you need to look at now and decide uh, during f certain phases of flight, how am I going to set things up? What am I going to be looking at? Uh, so that you're more in control of the information flow. So that's a skill. I think most pilots with a little bit of practice get pretty comfortable with the symbology, the colors, the way information is displayed, you know, airspeed and altitude tapes, for example. Uh, one thing that I do notice a lot is pilots who have upgraded their panels and maybe they had a heading bug, but they didn't have altitude bugs and some of these other things. They forget or don't use those effectively. Flight directors is a big thing. Pilots may have had an old autopilot, but often it didn't have a flight director. Um, and so now you need to practice with that and understand it. And in fact, I've actually started in the last couple of years, especially in the simulations, simulators that we use, the ATDs at the flight school where I teach, is I actually use the autopilot and flight director as a sort of virtual instructor. So you're teaching something like basic attitude flying. I start out with the autopilot and heading in altitude mode and the flight director on so the student can see, oh, if I want to enter a standard rate turn, what's the bank angle? What's the pitch attitude? How much power do I have to add or reduce in order to maintain speed? Same thing flying an approach. How does the autopilot and flight director fly an ILS? There's your pitch attitude. There's how the subtle bank corrections it makes to stay on course. That's the power setting and configuration that gives me the result I want. Hmm. Once I see that picture, and I actually have students get out their phones and take what I call a panel selfie when everything is all set up, now you just you know exactly what the targets are that you want to reach. And you get the side benefit of arriving at the end of your training, say for an instrument rating, really knowing how to use the equipment. Because if you look, for example, at the ACS, for the instrument rating and even for the private pilot certificate for that matter, you are required to know how to use the equipment in the airplane. And a lot of uh, our traditional training has been, well, autopilots, maybe we'll use that at the end of the training, but real men, you know, uh, don't use autopilots. That's absolutely wrong. And it's, again, to use the industry example, if you go to get a type rating in a jet, uh, they're going to first start you out using all the automation, and then they're going to gradually take it away from you so that you can demonstrate you know how to handle failures and emergencies. But they want you to use it in normal ops. They want you to be absolutely sure you know how to use it. Because, of course, there's we've seen many examples of people who have gotten into trouble because they didn't understand the automation. Bruce, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be back with some more questions. Sporties is your one-stop shop for the best flight simulator gear. From Honeycomb and Logitech to Thrustmaster and Redbird. Count on Sporties for the guaranteed lowest prices, fast shipping, and helpful advice from our team of pilots. Not sure what the best option is? Check out our library of articles and videos to help you make an informed decision. Find it all at sporties.com slash simulator. Now, back to pilot's discretion. We're back with Bruce Williams. And Bruce, in addition to the instructing you've done in technically advanced aircraft, you also spent many years teaching aerobatics and upset prevention in an extra 300. So for someone who isn't interested in flying air shows or really doing aerobatics, what's the value of this training? Oh, the training is extraordinarily valuable because, um, well, let me take a moment here. You know, if you talk to uh, anyone who's been through like a military training program, 
regardless of what they ended up flying, transports, tankers, or fighters, uh, during their primary training, they all got at least some basic uh, aerobatic training. I once saw a study from, I think it was Embry-Riddle or someplace, where they were talking about uh, unusual attitude recoveries. And one of the takeaways quotes that, from that study was that for the military trained pilot, there were no un, um, uh, unusual attitudes. There were only unexpected attitudes from something like a wake turbulence encounter, for example. But they'd been there before. And so the real challenge, of course, with most of us, you know, in an ideal world, uh, if I ran the world, every student pilot would start out in a glider, and then they would go to a Piper Cub and learn tailwheel with, you know, basic flying, and then they'd move on. But of course, that's not practical. We don't have the aircraft, the, the instructors, the system to do that. So we're going to fly Cessnas and Cherokees and similar airplanes in our primary training. And when you're teaching concepts and procedures like how to do stalls and stall prevention, we're really limited. The airplane can only stall, you know, in certain uh, benign sort of setups. And so most people, although they may have read about or even seen videos, haven't really seen, for example, a uh, an aggressive stall from a skidding turn uh, or uh, a stall w where the nose is actually below the horizon and the airplane is accelerating in a dive. Uh, and so that, you know, we all learn you can stall at any attitude, any airspeed, any power setting, but that doesn't really sink in because the only way we see it is with the nose high relative to the horizon at a slow speed, so on and so forth. So this kind of training really can help you uh, learn about those concepts and how they apply. You don't obviously have to do it in something like an extra, although there are some advantages we can talk about if you want. But um, the other big thing that I think this training does is address the general issue of the startle factor, which applies you know, regardless of what type of flying you're doing. But if you're suddenly presented with a novel, intense experience, such as an uh, uh, aggressive stall, uh, or you're flipped all, you know, past 90 degrees of bank because of wake turbulence, and you've never been there before, your brain needs time to process that experience. And we all freeze up. doesn't matter how experienced you are, how you know, good you are. If it's really intense and new, you're, it's going to slow. Your reaction is going to be slow. And so the, the advantage of doing some basic aerobatics, we're not talking about Lomshavox and air show stuff, but just loops and rolls and barrel rolls and you know, inverted flight is, oh, I've been there before. I've seen the world upside down. I've seen what happens if you stall at the top of a loop or on the backside of a loop. I can stall the airplane if I pull too hard on the, on the stick or the yoke, regardless of the speed the pitch attitude relative to the horizon, the power setting. And so that really helps set uh, these sorts of concepts in their, in their mind. I was never, I flew my extra for more than 20 years with a lot of students. You know, I always emphasize, we're not checking you out in the extra. You know, you're not, uh, I don't care if you don't have tailwheel experience, you're not going to be doing the landing. That's not the goal of this. The goal of this is to get you comfortable with this environment or introduce you at least to this environment so that if you're ever uh, confronted with this situation, part of your brain will at least be able to say, oh, I've been upside down. I remember what to do. Now, if I can't go out and do a full upset course or I'm a student pilot, I'm learning, is there some small way I can work on my airmanship, my stick and rudder skills, even if I'm flying a Cherokee or a Cessna 172? Absolutely. Uh, I have been long time been an advocate of, uh, for example, making sure that everybody, even private pilot students, uh, practice and understand things like accelerated stalls. They're not required except at the commercial or flight instructor level. Uh, but I like to show those to students and have them practice them. And I find that they're a real confidence builder because so many people are afraid of banking more than 20 or 30 degrees. They think just the bank is going to cause the stall speed to go up. There's another you know, misconception that we have. And so, yeah, practice this uh, with a good instructor. Even in a 172 or a Cherokee, you can practice some of these maneuvers and really start to help uh, understand these concepts that we all learn about during discussions of aerodynamics and how airplanes work and so forth. You mentioned earlier this concept of the puzzle, which I think is a great description of what we do as pilots. And you, you wrote it once this way, quote, for a lot of people, the real appeal of flying is that once you get the basic skills, a well-flown flight is this puzzle of weather, flight plan, and figuring out a route. I enjoy that process, end quote. So how do you teach that puzzle solving process? How do you get pilots to enjoy that process? 
Well, that's another great example of using simulation, whether it's a desktop sim or an ATD, that I think we don't do enough uh, in our training. So let's say you're a private pilot student and you're getting ready to do your cross countries. Um, why not get in the sim and actually fly par part of that cross country, plan it and fly it, and then think about what's going on? What would I be doing next? Um, you're not throwing any emergencies at anybody. You know, you're not, you're not really trying to, you know, scare them with bad weather. You're just trying to get the process down and get that thinking process uh, established. And so simulation is really good for that. Again, I use analogies. Uh, you know, if you're a um, musician, you practice your scales. If you're an athlete, you do drills. You dribble the basketball, you uh, putt, you go to the putting green, you practice on the driving range, you know, whatever it may be. And again, I think the analogy is very uh, apt. I don't think golf, for example, would be very popular if you could go out and in a quick weekend become a really good golfer. I think people actually, a lot of people actually like the fact that, hmm, I can always get better. I could, uh, you know, be better at driving the ball off the tee. I could be better at putting, whatever it may be. And they enjoy that part of the experience. And uh, the same thing applies to flying. I mean, I've never had a perfect flight where I got, I landed, shut down the engine and said, you know, you didn't make a mistake. That was just great. You, it went exactly according to plan. Uh, but again, I think that's part of the fun. And these, like, for example, this long trip I just did, I had a basic plan. I had some places I wanted to stop. I wanted to fly down the Chicago skyline and, and see that on a nice VFR day, for example. But I was, it never worked out exactly how I planned. Uh, there were, you know, the winds, the weather, whatever. You have to make adjustments. So, I think that's why flying is so popular uh, and, re and remains something that you can enjoy for decades in your life is that you don't just master it and then uh, move on. You can always uh, learn and improve. Great advice. And also, I think a great lesson that translates to the rest of your life, right? That's, that's real life. You make a plan, but uh, rarely does life go exactly according to plan. So if you can learn that skill as a pilot to do the work and, and have a plan, but then be able to react on the fly as conditions change. It's a good skill for life. Yeah. And I also say, getting back to simulation, I've often made the point that the only real limit, for example, to using simulation is your imagination or your instructor's imagination. We all know the basic things that you can do with a simulation. Uh, but let's take another example that I often use. You're working with a student trying to teach them airspace. And so they can look at a chart and they can tell you that's class Charlie airspace and here's the weather and equipment requirements and blah, blah, blah. But actually put them in a sim that's virtually moving and say you're flying from A to B and you've plotted a route that's going to take you across various airspace and you give them certain weather. And now you say, okay, while we're flying along, looking at the chart, how would you navigate this airspace? Can you avoid it? If you need to go through it for whatever reason, how do you, how do you accomplish that? Who do you talk to? Where do you find that information? These kinds of uh, skills in real time are extraordinarily valuable. And again, it just lets you have this kind of practice uh, where you can focus on a particular type of information or puzzle that you want to solve. Okay, Bruce, it's time for our Ready to Copy segment. So I'll ask some questions on a wide variety of topics and you give me your quick answer. Are you ready to copy? I'm ready to copy. You spent a lot of time in Beach Bonanzas, an airplane that has endured for over seven decades. What did they get right all those years ago when they designed the Bonanza? Boy, the Bonanza is just a delight to fly. It's got the, one of the nicest, the most uh, best harmonized controls of uh, any of the airplanes that I've flown. Uh, and as this recent flight I took uh, illustrates, it's a great traveling machine. What's a good pre-flight weather tool that more pilots should know about? Um, I love the aviation, uh, I mean, the area forecast discussions that are all the National Weather Service uh, Office issue. They're kind of my long-term or, or my outlook briefing tool. It's one of the first places I go if I'm planning a flight, say, in the next day or two. Should pilots practice more autopilot coupled approaches or fewer? I would say more. Uh, again, I'll quote Yeri, uh, Yogi Berra. He said, you can observe a lot by just watching. <laughs> and... Um, I often hear pilots say, if the weather's pretty good, I'll use the autopilot, let the autopilot fly. But when the weather's really low, I'm going to hand fly. And I think that's exactly backwards. If it's really crummy weather, down low to minimums, I'm letting the autopilot do that work while I observe and monitor. 
Uh, but you sh obviously you should be able to do both. But I, if I'm going to hand fly an approach, I want to do it when the when uh, the weather's better. Your extra was in Flight Simulator 10 or X, as some people call it. A great piece of trivia, I think. Other than that airplane, what's your favorite airplane to fly in Flight Simulator? Hmm, that's a tough one. I I enjoy uh, flying uh, just as a class. It would be fun to fly the higher performance, uh, like single engine. Uh, turbine aircraft or some of the twins, just because it's a different experience than what I typically have. When using flight simulators with young people, how much typical do they need in terms of introduction, or do you just turn on the computer and let them go? <laughs> well, they're pretty good at a lot of things. They're used to screens and, uh, and, and uh, seeing that virtual world. Uh, they're often a little too quick uh, and sort of twitchy with things because getting back to the game versus simulation uh, analogy, uh, they often think it's more like a sort of an Xbox game where you have to be really quick on the buttons and sometimes that gets them into trouble. Where do you think is, Flight Sim is going next? What are you looking forward to? Is it VR? Is it motion platforms? Something else? Well, I think motion platforms is probably oversold even in the real simulation world. I don't really think uh, uh, even up into the full flight simulator world that motion adds a whole lot to the majority of the training. Uh, so I, there's probably a small market segment for that. I think you're going to continue to see sort of the, the improvement in the visuals. And so using things like VR, whatever that turns into is going to become uh, more important, more of a immersive sort of 3D three uh, or more expansive field of view. Um, I obviously think the social part of it, having the ability to have like a virtual co-pilot or virtual instructor uh, with you is going to be cool. And of course, the scenery and the weather and all of the visual parts of the simulation are going to improve. I do hope that, for example, the new versions of Microsoft Flight Simulator as they develop will uh, focus more on things that I can use as an instrument pilot, for example, and less on just adding more scenery. The scenery is spectacular. It's amazing. but uh, I want to have a broader experience than just sightseeing. All right. We always like to go outside aviation. So as I understand it, you were an English major in college. <laughs> so I need an author recommendation. Who's an underrated author I should be reading? Outside of aviation? Absolutely. Um, Bruce Tolstoy, okay. Faulkner, you name it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Faulkner's great. Um, but, uh, well, I'm an absolute fanboy. He's not underrated, but of John le Carré who died a couple of years ago. I just, I read his books over and over and over again because I'm just in awe of his storytelling and of his use of language. So I, if you haven't read Le Carre, be patient. He requires, he respects his audience. He doesn't just tell you the story in you know a linear fashion, um, but he's a great read. Yeah, I agree with that. The Spy Who Came In From The Cold is still one of the best books ever written, I think. I'm a uh, Tinker Tailor guy, but that, there you go. <laughs> What's your favorite aviation book? Um, I, you know, I've read all of the classics. I'll have to uh, repeat, I think, uh, something that Jim Fallows mentioned on one of your previous podcasts. There's a great book that's, that's not mentioned often, and that is Inside the Sky by uh, the son of uh, Stick and Rudder. Uh, it's a great book because it's a sort of personal um, uh, story. And he has some very interesting chapters in there just about flying. So I highly recommend uh, Inside the Sky. Our last question is always the same on pilot's discretion. You have one final flight, and we want to know what are you flying and where are you going? Well, I already missed the extra since uh, it's now in the hands of the AOPA, and they're doing air safety, great air safety stuff with it. So I would have to go back into the extra, I think, and take somebody with me and just go up and loop and roll. You know, the old high flight thing, you know. <laughs> it, it's a delight to fly. It's uh, a wonderful airplane. And the experience of just being able to make uh, the clouds, you know, uh, twirl around and just basically fly in all three dimensions was wonderful. Bruce, thanks for being on the podcast. It's my pleasure. Thanks for listening to Pilot's Discretion, brought to you by Sporty's Pilot Shop, training and equipping pilots worldwide for over 60 years. For more episodes and links to additional information, visit sporties.com slash podcast. And if you enjoy this podcast, please leave a review in Apple Podcasts. I'm John Zimmerman. We'll see you next time on Pilot's Discretion.